Institute. My name is David Bowes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce our speaker this afternoon. I am a big fan of the movie Amazing Grace that came out last year. It tells the story of William Wilberforce, a member of Parliament who spent 50 years agitating for the abolition of slavery. And one of the things that inspires me about that movie is that I've been telling libertarian audiences lately, you know, if it took 50 years to persuade the citizens of the freest, most literate, most educated country in the world that it was wrong to hold their fellow citizens in chains, then maybe we should recognize it might take a long time to bring about various reforms that libertarians would like to bring about, but it reminds you that working at it for a long time can succeed. Um, I also just this uh, weekend started reading William Hague's biography of William Wilberforce, and I, I reflected there on William, William Hague was recently the leader of the Conservative Party in Great Britain. He's still a leader of the Conservative Party. Can one think of a leader of either of the parties in the U.S. Congress who could write a 500-page biography of a historical figure? Now, I mentioned this to a colleague who said, and I sort of laughed and said, imagine Joe Biden writing a 500-page biography of Daniel Webster, and he said, well, Joe Biden might tear the cover off this one and send it into a publisher claiming it was his work. Um, I guess that's a possibility. But it's an inspiring story, um, and I look forward to reading the rest of the book. It is one of the greatest stories in the history of the world. I was asked once by some skeptical neoclassical economists what's the greatest accomplishment libertarianism ever had? And I said, well, um, the bringing of power under the control of law. And they kind of scoffed that that was not something you could measure, so how could it be useful? And they said, well, anything else, anything more recent? So, well, the abolition of slavery. That was a pretty important libertarian accomplishment. It is a truly great accomplishment. Charles Murray, when he did his book, Human Accomplishment, said, I'm thinking of this as a resume of the human race. What would you put on your resume for the human race? Now, I guess he wouldn't have counted the abolition of slavery because he said, you don't put on your resume, I stopped beating my wife. It's not an achievement to stop doing evil things. It's only an achievement to do something positive that didn't exist before. But if you have been beating your wife, then it, it is a good thing to stop. And if you have been holding people in slavery for thousands of years, it is a tremendous story to stop doing that. So our speaker today, Jim Powell, is a fellow of the Cato Institute, and he has been uh, writing the history of freedom in both its positive and its negative chapters for the past decade or more, turning out quite a number of books. Uh, perhaps the first one in this History of Freedom series was a book called The Triumph of Liberty, a 2,000-year history told through the lives of freedom's greatest champions, and this told about great men and women throughout history who had worked for freedom. Then he turned his attention to some of freedom's adversaries, and he wrote a series of books starting with FDR's Folly, and then he did Wilson's War, about how Woodrow Wilson's War got us into all the bad aspects of the 20th century. And then a book called Bully Boy, which was not in fact about John McCain, but rather about his childhood hero, or, or his adult hero actually, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, <coughs> Jim got tired of being depressed, and he's turned his attention back to the positive side of advancements in freedom. And he has a new book out called Greatest Emancipations, How the West Abolished Slavery. And in this book, he asks, how is it that slavery, which was unchallenged in principle or practice for thousands of years, disappeared in a single century? I was going to say suddenly disappeared in a single century. Well, to the people who lived in the 19th century, it didn't seem so sudden. And yet, in the context of human history, it happened all at once, almost all over the world. 
So he's going to talk about that today. So please welcome our one-man publishing house for liberty, Jim Powell. Thank you, David. It's always uh, great to be back here at Cato where so much uh, important work for liberty is being done. Uh, emancipation is a great story, and I'm glad to share a little bit of it with you. Uh, it's a reminder that even when terrible things are happening and the odds seem to be overwhelming against us, that it, it is possible to change the hearts and minds of people for the better. Now, as David noted, uh, slavery has been around for thousands of years. Every civilization had it. Powerful interest groups supported it. Uh, Pro-slavery interests were well represented in Western governments. And if we were to imagine the scene in 1800, uh, slavery was approaching a peak in the West. The smartest people thought that it would go on indefinitely, if not forever. It was just very, very hard to see how could you ever get rid of anything that was that entrenched and that widely supported. Uh, and yet, uh, again, as David noted, it was uh, with, by, by 1888, chattel slavery, which is the worst form, was gone from the Western Hemisphere. And in most cases, uh, the process occurred fairly peacefully. I mean, there was some conflict everywhere, but, but huge uh, 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 amounts of violence, such as we saw in, in the two major exceptions, Haiti and the United States. Uh, didn't occur. In, in Haiti, uh, people could not get beyond the idea that if you didn't kill, you were going to be killed. And ever since the uh, Haitian slave revolt that started in 1791, uh, the people there have suffered through some 200 revolts, coups, and dictatorships. Uh, in the United States, although the North won the decisive military victories, white supremacists soon regained full political control of the South. And the killing and destruction of the war gave the losers an uncontrollable lust for revenge, and there was nobody who could be counted on to protect the former slaves. And civil rights were subverted for another century. How then, one might ask, how did the more peaceful emancipations occur? because we all know that slaveholders were always trying to delay emancipation as much as possible. They, were, they would always try to avoid any kind of deadline for setting the slaves free. Then if they did have to agree to a deadline, they'd try to push it back. How else could you achieve emancipation without a lot of force? Well, the, the story really starts with uh, getting a, a decisive moral argument against slavery. And the argument was not religious. As pro-slavery authors kept reminding us, there was plenty of support for slavery in the Bible, injunctions to obey your master and so on. A legal argument against slavery was not possible because slavery found so much support in Western constitutions, uh, statutes, and court decisions. The decisive moral argument against slavery came from the natural rights philosophy that individuals as human beings are entitled to life, liberty, and property. And the most basic form of property is your own body, the self-ownership principle. The natural rights philosophy blossomed in England during the 1640s and uh, among a group of writers known as levelers. Natural rights was the revolutionary doctrine made famous in the opening lines of the Declaration of Independence. And even though the principal author was slaveholder Thomas Jefferson, the radical American abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison repeatedly referred to the Declaration as his gospel. Uh, the first abolitionist movement began in Great Britain in 1787. Thomas Clarkson was the organizational genius who did more than anybody else to make the movement happen. He was perhaps the first to seriously investigate slavery and the slave trade. 
He visited the principal slave trade ports of Bristol, Liverpool, and London. He interviewed thousands of sailors, sea captains, doctors, and many others with firsthand knowledge of slave trade. Uh, he became convinced that it was impractical to target slavery initially because it was so entrenched. Slavery had to be eroded and weakened before there was a chance that a frontal assault could work. Clarkson came to the conclusion that a powerful argument could be, a powerful practical argument could be made against the slave trade because the British depended on the Royal Navy to defend their island. And the Royal Navy, in turn, depended on their ability to recruit large numbers of sailors in an emergency. Well, the slave trade had always been defended uh, from a practical standpoint as, as the great nursery of sailors because the slave trade kept all these sailors active and in an emergency the Royal Navy would know where to go for, for people who, whose, uh, whose experience and skills were fresh. But Clarkson's research suggested that shocking numbers of British sailors died in the slave trade. More British sailors died in the slave trade than in any other branch of British commerce because the, the slaves were so wretchedly treated that they were susceptible to all kinds of diseases and the sailors had to deal with the with the sick slaves so they got sick and many of them died and the the sailors on the slave ships were treated as badly as sailors on many of the other ships so in fact far from being the nursery of sailors the slave trade was the grave of sailors this national security argument got the attention of British Prime Minister William Pitt there was an additional angle here that in every Western society except the United States, slave populations naturally tended to decline, probably because of the harsh working conditions in the tropics. And without fresh shipments of slaves, the, the plantations were unable to maintain their workforces. So if the slave trade could be disrupted and eventually abolished, that would in fact strike uh, a, a pretty serious blow against slavery itself. Uh, Clarkson began to do a lot of speaking. He was dramatizing everything as much as he could. In his, in his researches, he, would, he collected slaving gear, he collected shackles, he collected whips, he collected leg braces, neck braces, all kinds of uh, thumb screws, all kinds of of things that were used to discipline slaves or keep them captive in, in transit. And he would display these things to people who had no idea because most of the people in England cared, they didn't know anything about slavery, it was something happening on the other side of the ocean, and what they mainly cared about was to continue getting their, their slave-produced products, cotton, coffee, sugar, other things like that. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Clarkson would show would be slave ship diagrams such as this one where you can see these little uh, uh, the all the slaves are fit in like like sardines is in as compact a space as possible it, it, it was a space that might be not much more than three or four feet high if that sometimes less it varied from ship to ship but people are just crammed in and this is where they were uh, chained to one another so that the, the sanitary conditions were awful. Well, people were shocked. They had no idea. Um, Clarkson uh, talked about the sh shocking practices in the slave trade. For, for example, uh, uh, the, the practice that the ships had of dumping slave, six slaves overboard to drown. And uh, the reason for that was that a... Uh, <clears throat> A uh, ship could collect insurance on slaves who were lost overboard, but they could not collect insurance on a slave who was sick. So if the slaves were sick, the, the, this is a, uh, a painting by uh, 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 J.M.W. Turner, famous English painter. He's pre-impressionist, pre so it may be a little hard for you to see what he's depicting here in all this spectacular displays of color, but this is a ship which is in the process of dumping 
slaves overboard so they can collect the insurance because the slaves are sick and they didn't want them to infect the other slaves and you know further increase their losses. Well, again, these were ways of trying to take home to people what the, what the, the horrifying meaning of of slavery, which was something that was otherwise quite uh, foreign to them. Um, to generate pressure against slavery, Clarkson organized anti-slavery societies throughout England. He organized uh, mass meetings. He organized petition drives that uh, sent Congress, that bombarded Congress with petitions signed by as many as 400,000 people in a single year. And uh, th these were all techniques that had not been done before. They're now quite familiar, of course, but he, he, was, he really pioneered that. Uh, Clarkson played a key role recruiting allies in Parliament, and as David noted, the most important of those allies was William Wilberforce, who embraced the moral case against slavery uh, passionately and uh, promoted it with evangelical fervor. Wilberforce displayed extraordinary dedication as he, he kept introducing bills to abolish the slave trade. He, he just uh, fought this stubborn parliamentary opposition for years before opinion changed enough that something could happen. And Wilberforce played a key role in securing passage of the 1807 law that made it illegal for British citizens to participate in the slave trade. The law took effect in 1808, just two centuries ago. During the 1820s, uh, Clarkson, Wilberforce, and a younger member of parliament named Thomas Buxton launched another movement, this time aimed at slavery itself. And they were able to, uh, to uh, abolish slavery in Jamaica and the other uh, British possessions in the Caribbean by 1838. Uh, let me see. This is a uh, illustration from the Illustrated London News from the uh, 1830s. Uh, a slave in Jamaica uh, hears of his liberation. Now, this was a particularly important one, in my opinion, the, the British emancipation. It was the most, it seems to have been the most peaceful of all emancipations. And a principal reason uh, it was that the parliament had been persuaded to appropriate 20 million pounds to pay off the slaveholders to get out of the slavery business. Now, this policy was denounced by American abolitionists uh, because, after all, it was the slaves who were forced to work for nothing who deserved compensation. The slaveholders didn't deserve compensation. And, of course, a major reason why that bill was passed uh, was the political clout of the, the uh, Caribbean slaveholders in Parliament. But there was also a great deal of practical wisdom in that policy because there was a recognition that after emancipation, most of the former slaveholders and the former slaves were going to end up in the same society together. Most of them probably were not able or inclined to, to move someplace else. And the former slaveholders had a lot more clout. There's going to be nobody to protect them. Nobody anywhere could be counted on to protect former slaves after emancipation. So if there's nobody who can protect the former slaves after emancipation, it really made sense to minimize the incentives that the former slaveholders had to terrorize the slaves as happened in the United States. There was no way to protect, either no way or no means to protect the former slaves from the former slaveholders if they were motivated by revenge. And in fact, this was a peaceful transition. This was the most peaceful. Uh, there were uh, you know, other events that happened later, but uh, the, the, uh, the, the strategy, as I'll discuss, was also used in Spanish and Portuguese America with very similar uh, results. The uh, peaceful methods that were pioneered by the British abolitionists were later adopted by uh, William Lloyd Garrison and his campaign for uh, 
uh, abolishing American slavery. They were adopted by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her campaign for women's rights, and later by Mohandas Gandhi for his campaign for Indian independence, and by Martin Luther King and his campaign for uh, civil rights. Meanwhile, the uh, British citizens, having withdrawn from the slave trade, their places were taken by citizens from other countries, in particular France, Portugal, Spain, and uh, the United States. British diplomats began a decades-long process of negotiating anti-slave trade treaties with the European powers that had uh, slave colonies in the West. Britain's Royal Navy worked to enforce these anti-slave trade treaties. And uh, it was quite an extraordinary campaign by the Royal Navy that went on for uh, more than a half century. Uh, this is a picture of a capture that occurred. This is the HMS Arab. That's the name of it, the Arab, uh, capturing a, Portuguese, a, a Cuban slave ship off the coast of Cuba in uh, 1856. The, the uh, artist you might be interested to know was one of the crew on the uh, HMS Arab. He was a 15-year-old cabin boy named Jonathan Starris, and he, he looked pretty good to me. So uh, this, this was a hugely important factor. The, the, the British did not go around starting land wars. They, if they didn't have a, a treaty to uh, use against the slave trade, as they, they, they did not get with the United States, the British Navy didn't touch uh, those ships. But they're basically trying to... Uh, make it harder for slave traders to go. They had to, they had to fly somebody's flag, otherwise they were going to be considered a pirate, and it was open game on pirates. And the British flag was no longer available. The American flag was still available. So gradually they're taking, negotiating. They eventually they take out the Spanish flag and the Portuguese flag, so it becomes harder for, for the uh, slave ships to operate. Um, the... Uh, The uh, slave, um, uh, the um, the British did a great deal, as I've indicated, to get the movement started, developing the ideas, the enforcement. But emancipation would never have occurred if the slaves had not taken a great deal of initiative to help themselves. If the slaves had just been standing idly by, waiting for somebody to save them, uh, nothing would have happened. The first way that slaves helped themselves, ironically, was to revolt. Now, as I mentioned in the case of Haiti, if the only thing that's happening is a great deal of violence, it's very hard to get beyond that. And in fact, Haiti was not successful in creating a free society. However, it was very important that Haiti, that, that the, the, uh, the revolutionaries in Haiti uh, gain independence and prevent Napoleon from reestablishing slavery because that sent a, a vital message to slaveholders everywhere, that slavery could consume them all and it would be better, safer, to negotiate, uh, to negotiate emancipation. This is a uh, illustration. gives you a little bit of an idea of the uh, of the of what went on in Haiti. Haiti was particularly violent because it was actually a combination of of strategies. There was a struggle for emancipation going on, and there was a struggle for independence from France going on. And throughout the period, there was a constant switching of sides. And you had, this is in the 1790s, you had the British and the Spanish coming in to try to take some territory. So th there were a lot of people going after a lot of people. Um, another example of a slave revolt, slaves helping themselves, was the revolt on the uh, Amistad. The Amistad was a Cuban ship, 1839, and uh, the, uh, the slaves revolted. 
and uh, killed everybody on board except two of the Cubans. The Africans wanted to go back to Africa, uh, but they didn't know how to navigate. And the two survivors, the two Cuban survivors, tricked them. And the ship ended up on Long Island. And the result was one of the most famous trials in American history. Uh, eventually, it led to a Supreme Court decision in 1841 that granted the uh, granted freedom to the uh, uh, to the slaves, the 25 uh, men and boys and three girls. And uh, Steven Spielberg made a great movie of the subject, uh, 1997, I think it was. Another way, in many ways, the more important way uh, of slaves helping themselves involve running away. And uh, running away <coughs> had a number of functions. One, of course, you're increasing the number of free blacks. You're reducing the slave population than it would otherwise be. This is a picture of slaves crossing the Rappahannock, is that how you pronounce it, Rappahannock River? <laughs> uh, and you, you can see there are a lot of People. A, lot of them, a lot of them got caught, but there was still a tremendous outflow. And I would say that, uh, that uh, runaway slaves in terms of numbers and, and impact on, on the, the end result was actually more important in other countries like Brazil, where, where the number of runaways was massive toward the end of the process. There were just uh, in, in places where there were more opportunities to, uh, to run away. This is a... Uh, Great painting of a runaway slave by Eastman Johnson, Knight Rider. Uh, so uh, now, in the winter time, you had less supervision on plantations, but it was also the toughest time to run away because without foliage, it was harder to hide in the woods. When you had snow, the slaves could be tracked down more easily, and nobody in the South had winter clothing that would uh, keep them uh, safe and healthy, certainly when they got north. And unfortunately, because of the uh, situation in the United States, where uh, the President of the United States and mayors and governors were all supportive of slave hunters coming north, they, the slaves were really not safe until they crossed into Canada. So. They, they could, you know, any, anywhere in New York or Boston or any place, they could, they could be snatched off the streets without much, you know, without any protection at all. Uh, so this was a very serious issue. Uh, I'm sure you all know about Harriet Tubman, but uh, she was such an amazing person. She's on the left here with a group of slaves she escorted north. Uh, after having escaped herself, she then went back and got another 300. On, on many trips. It was really quite a uh, spectacular accomplishment. And another aspect of running away was that slaves came with horror stories that were publicized by the abolitionists. So what's going on now? And the situation was changing. They were bringing essentially news from the, uh, from the front lines. And Frederick Douglass uh, is uh, by far, I think, the, the best known of those, he, since he, he actually became a, a major author and orator. Um, but this was, this was true elsewhere as well, that, the, that there was propaganda, uh, the tremendous propaganda value coming from the runaways, what was, what was happening, the, sh the, the latest in shocking abuses and so on. And uh, that was a big help to the, to the abolitionists and overall to the cause. So they're doing very important things to help themselves. It was immensely important. Uh, now, from the 1820s through the 1850s, one South American, Central American country after the other emancipated slaves. We don't hear about them so much, Venezuela, Bolivia, Mexico, Uruguay, and so on, because they had smaller slave populations. But the fact was they were... They also had entrenched interests. We've seen in this country with, with many different issues how small groups, uh, such as Alaska bridge builders, uh, can still have a lot of political clout. So you didn't need a whole lot of slaves 
to influence legislators and stall the whole process. So it, it was difficult everywhere. It was most difficult in the United States because we had the largest slave population, 4 million in 1860. But by 1860, there were only three major slave societies left, the United States, Cuba, and Brazil. Uh, there was increasing pressure against slavery, just coming from the movements of people and markets, because uh, immigrants, investors, inventors, industrialists, all wanted to locate in a place that had as much freedom as possible. They, they were not interested in moving to the American South. Uh, the workers didn't want to compete with slave. I mean, how, why do you want to compete with somebody who's, who's getting paid nothing? Uh, and, um, you know, uh, there's just too much talent that, uh, that, that, that you need. So, um, and, and, and you, you need an, an, an environment, a free environment where talent can flourish um, and where there are incentives for people to uh, improve themselves. Um, now, in Cuba, uh, the slaveholders had a lot of clout. The abolitionist cause had to advance with halfway measures, compromises, which uh, American abolitionists didn't like. The uh, most effective Cuban abolitionist was Julio Viz Carando. He was a Puerto Rican Creole. He started agitating for emancipation in Cuba and then quickly realized that decisions for Cuba were made in the, in the mother country in Spain. So he went to Spain, launched an anti-slavery society there. He, uh, he spent his high school years in the United States where he came into contact in the North with uh, some of ideas about emancipation and individual rights. He married an American Quaker, and uh, he got things started there. Uh, but as I said, in, in the Spanish America, you tended to get, and Portuguese, you tended to get a lot of these compromises, such as uh, an 1870 law in Cuba that began to free uh, the children of, of slaves, the free birth law, and also slaves over 60. Well, that wasn't much of a, uh, that, that, that did not free very many people in practice. The, the children still had to work as apprentices. But what those compromises did when they came was to, uh, the, the, they were sweet poison because they asserted, they, they uh, uh, underscored a principle that the government that had supported slavery for so long could withdraw its support. And slavery, although it was formidable in many ways, slavery has always depended on a great deal of government support. The laws making it illegal for slaves to travel freely. Laws saying the slaves cannot bear arms. Slaves cannot even wave a stick without getting whipped. Slaves cannot learn how to read. All these laws, the, the reason the laws were there clearly is because if you take them away, slavery was in trouble. The slaves would run away. There wouldn't be any workforce to take the crops in. So when political support is undermined in a variety of ways, such as I have mentioned, there's less uh, ability to count on government to enforce the laws that prop the whole thing up. So what you find in Spanish and uh, Portuguese America in, in Brazil, I might mention a man named Joaquim Nabucco, who started the Anti-Slavery Society in, uh, in Brazil. And uh, <clears throat> Brazil is one of my favorite cases because it involves the, perhaps the widest variety of, of anti-slavery methods. They had, uh, Nabucco started uh, anti-slavery societies around Brazil. The Brazilian abolitionist meetings became boisterous affairs with performers emerging through a shower of rose petals. When, when slaves would be freed, they would have parties. They had competitions to see who would uh, have, have achieved. They would uh, compete for slave-free streets, slave-free towns, slave-free districts, slave-free provinces, and uh, all of which meant that as the slave-free areas were expanding, it became easier to run away because all of a sudden a lot more people were closer to an area where they could go and the abolitionists would send secret agents to plantations and tell them how and where to go. And uh, 
uh, by the, the uh, late 1880s, 1886, 87, entire plantation workforces were just disappearing. And uh, the, the, the whole political situation began to change against them. And industrialists, businessmen wanted to get out of this whole thing because uh, the, the view became more and more widely held that you cannot have a modern society, you cannot have a prosperous society with slavery. It's, it's just too backward. Nobody has incentives to improve when you cannot uh, keep the fruits of your labor. Uh, you, you need too much cooperation from too many people. And as, as, as I'm sure you all know, you, uh, I'm sure you all know something about the history of invention of how many, how many great inventors have come from the most humble backgrounds, mechanics and people who uh, who, who uh, were simply doing their work and were very much aware of what, what was doing, you know, what was working, what wasn't. You need to harness all of this energy. And uh, anyway, so uh, in conclusion, I, I would suggest that the, uh, the uh, process of emancipation, uh, we, we, we need to understand um, Americans mainly know about the Civil War, but in fact, a great, a great deal was accomplished, if not almost everything, through voluntary processes that are changing the hearts and minds of people. As we saw in the South, if you simply bring an army in there, you're, you're going to get resistance. And it doesn't make any difference what the cause is, whether it's uh, uh, nationalism or it's slavery or it's something else, if, if you do not have a substantial buy-in from the population, you are going to be taking three steps forward and two steps back and you're going to get embroiled in a civil war and guerrilla matters and other things like that. So I frankly happen to believe that we would have been better off if we could have uh, uh, avoided a uh, catastrophic war in the United States and you can say that about other places, but there's so much uh, so many wonderful things that took place in, in the story of emancipation through the, the individuals who were trying to change opinion, speaking, writing, helping slaves run away. All of those things brought us to the point where we were. And it's just such an extraordinary development in a few decades. Uh, I might go one step beyond this story in, in my book. I talk about... Uh, uh, the uh, slavery in the Congo. By the 1880s, King Leopold, when, when he was establishing his, his slave society in the Congo, the European opinion was so much against slavery by that point that he felt he had to do it secretly. And he conducted an elaborate public relations effort to portray himself as a great benefactor of Africans. He set up a society and he was the head of it and he built statues and did all these things in case there were revelations about his dirty work so that nobody would believe it. But in fact, despite his money, and he had a lot of it, uh, and his prestige and all of that, he was exposed and forced to uh, surrender control of the Congo by an abolitionist society in another country, in England. And the abolitionist society in another country was based on the work of just five individuals. There was an African-American journalist, an African-American missionary, a Polish novelist, an English shipping clerk, and an Irish diplomat. And within a few years. Leopold was gone. Uh, chattel slavery was pretty much gone. The conditions were still going to be wretched for quite a while, but uh, when you look and see what's involved in, in achieving any, any kind of change, it, it's a huge job. And they, they came a huge distance, and I think we can all be thankful for that. Thank you. Jim, we want to take some questions, and you might as well stay at the podium since we only have one speaker here, and uh, we'll and, and just call on people. We'll bring a microphone around, and while you're getting arranged there, um, I'm going to ask the first question.
everybody knows about slavery in the United States, but you talked about, and, and of course, I, I saw the movie uh, Amazing Grace about William Wilberforce's effort to abolish slavery in Great Britain, and yet I have no sense of slavery in Great Britain. I, uh, I, don't, I don't see it in the Jane Austen novels and, and the other things I've read about the history of England. Is there much slavery in England, or is it England's overseas empire that, that Wilberforce and Clarkson were concerned about? Yeah, it's entirely in the overseas empire. Uh, there were a very small number of slaves in England during the 1700s, but there were also a number of court cases. There was a famous court case um, involving somebody from somebody from the Caribbean, a captain, or somebody brings one slave in. Uh, so this would be in the 1770s. And that became a court case. And, you know, the British don't have a neatly written constitution like we do. It consists of, or had consisted of, an accumulation of centuries of court cases and various things that came to set precedence and, and be taken as policy. And uh, that's, that particular slave was freed because it was found in some case or other that um, they, they, the, the system did not, the English law system in England did not support slavery. But overseas was different. That was the problem. The, the people, uh, but now in Southern Europe, in, in Spain and Portugal, you did have, you did have a fair number of slaves, uh, you know, into the modern period. Yes, sir. No, go ahead. Oh. Uh, Chris Grieb, um, first of all, wasn't the slave trade in the United States abolished in 1808? Uh, American the imports, were there slave imports? Okay, slave imports. No, not, not participation okay. in the slave can you Can you picture another, if Lincoln had allowed like the first five southern states to stay on their own, would there have been a wouldn't there have been a tremendous amount of pressure in the rest of the South to begin getting rid of slavery? <clears throat> in other words, if the states like Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama had left, and there had been the border states have been allowed to stay in, wouldn't there have been kind of a lot of pressure? When is there another? Can you picture another scenario in the United States of a, are getting rid of slavery? Other than the Civil War? Other than the Civil War. Yes. Uh, now, I think, I, I would say at the offset, there are some people, uh, Lincoln is not one of my favorite presidents. And, but, and, and then some people really say he was, he was a terrible, terrible person. I, I personally don't think the outcome would have made much difference with or without Lincoln, uh, because I think a lot of it had to do with, a lot of the consequences had to do with the war. And I say that because, now I think, I think it would be hard to avoid, a, the, the, it would have been hard to avoid a war b simply because there had not been a recent terrible war to make people afraid of it. You, you, you think of the Cold War period where you had two superpowers and they resist, why did they, why did the United States and the Soviet Union not attack each other? Well, because they were afraid of a nuclear escalation. There wasn't such a thing in, during, in 1860 both the North and the South were flooded with recruits. This was going to be a glorious brief war. They were all eager for it. The earlier precedent was the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, if war could have been avoided and the South, the Southern states, uh, the slave states had seceded peacefully, my hunch is that there would have been increasing pressure on them to... Uh, you know, slavery would have been under increasing pressure, which is kind of the contrary. Most people think, well, if we didn't force them, then we're letting them go on with slavery as long as they want. But in fact, I think it's quite subversive to have a long border with a non-slave territory. I think the first thing that, may, maybe the first thing that would have happened if we had avoided war and let the southern states secede peacefully is that the politics of fugitive slave law enforcement would have changed completely. As, it, it, since when everybody was in one country, we had the President of the United States, and we had governors, and we had the mayor of New York and Boston say, you know, welcoming the slave hunters to get all the, because they didn't, didn't want free blacks in their, in their town. So, now, if the South secedes, they are rejecting 
the North. They're insulting and rejecting the North. We saw part of the recruitment for the Civil War was, was a nationalist response. So the, the South now is rejecting, insulting the North by, by walking out of this great country we had. Is it going to be politically possible after secession to have slave hunters coming in? Are they going to get support from the president, from the governors, the states? I think now that now the South is a foreign country. The Canadians did not permit Americans to go into their country and seize peaceful people off the streets. We didn't permit Canadians to come in. Are we going to permit these slave hunters to come in as they have been? Is the fugitive slave law? I think that's basically going to be by the boards, and I would guess that the slave, uh, the, the runaway slaves would have been substantially safe upon crossing the U.S. border. They would not have had to go several hundred miles further north to Canada. And so uh, I think there would have been an increase in the number of runaways. And that would have, I, I think the South probably would have been taking ever more stringent measures to stop the runaways. Probably, ultimately, maybe building a wall, barbed wire, shooting on sight, anybody trying to escape. Oh, that would have been a, I think that would have had a, likely have had political repercussions. It's con confirming everything the abolitionists were saying about what a barbaric system slavery was. Uh, beyond that, uh, you had a, a long-established trend, in part caused by runaways, in part by the economics, of slaves in the, in the Middle South being sold to the Deep South. So every year, quite a separate issue from runaways, there were fewer slaves in the, in the Upper South. They were being sold South. Among other things, that meant that the slaveholders could get something for them. If they ran away, then they got nothing. So, so that meant that every year, more slaves being sold to the Deep South. There were fewer people in the Upper South who had a direct stake in slavery. The slaveholders in the, in the Upper South, their political clout was, was gradually going down. At the same time, the concentration of slaves in the Lower South was increasing, about half the population. That's getting to the point where there's an increased risk of slave revolt. So you have some instability in the existing trend. Plus, as I mentioned, you have all the migration coming to the United States was going to the north. The, all the immigrants to, to open up farms and investors, inventors, the industries, all that was going to the north. So you're having an increasing gap economically. And there are already, 1860, there are already more southerners moving north because of the multiplying opportunities than there were northerners going south. So you have another trend. Now, the, also, the, the heavy reliance on a few crops meant that the South, much less diversified economy, they were sus more susceptible to falling prices of those crops. And in fact, you did get uh, falling prices later in the, uh, you know, the, the 19th century, 1870s, 1880s. A part of that, I'll grant you, was related to the, it was a, the contraction following the Civil War inflation. But, uh, you know, the, the point remains they're vulnerable because it's a less uh, diversified economy. So it's a, and then people say, well, how, when do I think the slaves would have been emancipated without the Civil War? I'm sure it would have come later. But I would also imagine that full civil rights would have come decades earlier because if, if a variety of persistent, peaceful pressures had been brought to bear on, on the uh, slave states, you would have been able to achieve emancipation without the uncontrollable backlash. And I, th I personally think the uncontrollable backlash is an absolutely fascinating phenomenon. How is it that the North could win the war decisively and yet have the white supremacists very quickly begin to regain full political control? You have the... the, the uh, the, the subversion of black civil rights is promoted by Lincoln's hand-picked successor. If you can't count on Lincoln to pick a successor and keep his humane policies going, then uh, what, what can you count on? And not only that, by 1876, the party of Lincoln, the Republican Party, what do they do? They, you have this contested election of, of Hayes and his Democratic opponent. And they, they have, you know, they have a little uh, back and forth going to figure out who's going to get what. And the Republicans decide it's more important for us to get our guy in the White House than to have anything to do with the South. So the deal was Hayes goes in the White House and the Democrats, the, the, the last three uh, states that were still under 
uh, official military occupation. The, the, the federal last federal troops are withdrawn, and uh, Democrats go on to, you know, do what they did for another another century, subverting civil rights. So like, you get back to the fact that nowhere could 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 blacks count on, you know, somebody to protect. You know, no, nowhere could the former slaves count on anybody to protect them, particularly if, if there was uh, revenge and, and killing and so on. So uh, it, it, it was hugely important to avoid uh, a backlash if that because it was truly uncontrollable. Yes, sir. Right. Um, let's see. So I was listening to you, and I also. Uh, read an article of yours uh, that touched on the same subject as well a little before I came here. Um, so one thing that comes to mind, I really don't believe that without the Civil War, the Southerners would have been, white Southerners would have been less violent towards black people. I think that they had embraced an ideology of white supremacism that would that left them predisposed towards terrorist attacks against black people and or sympathy towards those who committed that sort of violence and terrorism against black people. So whatever losses the union may have inflicted on them, I think they just provided a pretext for the violence that they probably would have done anyway, even if slavery had come to an end another way. And then also if, let's say, there was another means for slavery to, to come to an end other than the Civil War, maybe it would have taken several decades. You know, William Wilberforce took, what was it, 50 years to convince the British public not to, uh, to put an end to slavery. So then it wouldn't have been those people who were emancipated historically, they wouldn't have been emancipated right then, most likely. It would have been their descendants. So in terms of their, those people's individual liberty, the Civil War would have been the only option. That, that war, that violence, with all whatever cost there was to it, those people, the majority of them, would not have received emancipation without it. Now, of course, they had to deal with the oppression and violence and terrorism afterwards, but I doubt that any of them would have preferred to remain as, as slaves, even with that violence that was visited upon them and their descendants. So, Well, the, the first thing is that uh, in response to your first point, <clears throat> you're, you're absolutely right, of course, conditions were terrible uh, before the Civil War. So whatever you want to call it, you want to call it racism, uh, whatever, that was one thing. And now if you add to it a backlash against war, backlash to get even, revenge, you're, you're adding revenge to racism. That is a worse mix than what you had. Both are bad, but it's, and it's a very similar phenomenon to what we saw in Germany after World War I and you know, in many other places. It's not specific to the Civil War. We saw this in, in, in Central Europe after the Napoleonic conquests. He did all these wonderful reforms, and he enforced them with his army, and people didn't like that. And at their earliest opportunity, they're going to strike back. We've seen the British and the Irish go on for centuries. So you're adding one thing to the other. It's a much more difficult situation to deal with, and it, it was truly uncontrollable. In, in terms of uh, you know, talking about when and how quickly can you get emancipation, the, 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 the underlying issue is that abolitionists were, abolitionists were a minority in the North and blacks were a minority in the South. You're dealing with a majority and even in the North, as we well know, there's very mixed support. There's support, you know, maybe a quarter or a third of the people in the North were very supportive of the abolitionists. A lot of people didn't want blacks in their neighborhood. A lot of people didn't care. Uh, then there were Democrats in the North who were hostile. So ha if you start, if you're a minority, you don't want to get in a fight with somebody who's bigger than you are. You gotta you know, do, use other means, gotta use your wits. You have to 
but you know, it, it's like George Washington recognized that he could. He had a, a, a small ragtag army that was leaving him every six months. If he got into a direct confrontation, that would just play to the strength of his opponent. He had to adopt. I mean, this is why guerrilla tactics. The word guerrilla came from the Spanish fights against Napoleon. They, they had to be hit and run, or like the French resistance against Hitler. That's what you have to do if you're. If you are small in numbers, small in in arm, you know, in armed forces, and, and small in economic power, and so on. That's true, but I mean, those are two different things. Here you have the North, the white Northerners. They're the ones who are working the problem from the South. It wasn't necessarily black people. Right, 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 right. So I just don't see where. That's correct. They would have the, the slavery would have. I'm sure slavery would have gone on for a few decades longer, and I think civil rights would have full civil rights would have come decades earlier by avoiding the backlash. Now, the, the problem is we're talking about, you know, it was too slow. The reform emancipation was too slow. If we didn't have a war, we really should be emancipated. So maybe war is the only way to go. But the problem with that. Is the assumption that that as a minority, and I'm not, I could be speaking of anybody of any wars, is is the idea that that you know some whoever we're talking about can control the outcome of the war. And as we saw in the United States, fine, you win the war, but then they turn their back. The Republicans turn their backs on it. Yeah, that's true. You you've gotten. Let's get some other people asking questions. Okay, go ahead. You raise very good questions. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I think this is really the uh, counterfactual argument is really among the weakest points of your book, because I th the war was caused by Southern intransigence and even the prospect of uh, not allowing slavery in the territories. Lincoln himself said during a cabinet meeting when the war began, no one would have dared to interfere with the institution where it existed. The right. Republicans re uh, refu uh, abiding by their campaign platform of not allowing its expansion in the territories provoked the, re the secession, which any constitutional president would have been bound to resist by force. So I, I don't see, and the, if you talk about revenge, certainly seeing blacks in Union uniforms was provocative to many Southern whites. But if you read the speeches given by Southern delegates trying to convince the border states to secede, you get the same kind of racist paranoia that took effect after 1877 was there in its noxious form from the beginning. And uh, Alexander Stevens, trying to make a point about what the, the South stood for, said, we, we stand for white supremacy. And this was not a controversial statement in Montgomery in 1860 when he was sworn in as vice president. So I really don't see how you can get a counterfactual history of an, an alternate path, and it's very easy to temporize if you're not a slave. I mean, this institution had been going on for to over 260 years, and that it should somehow last, if it only lasted another decade, other additional decades or centuries, we could have avoided the Civil War. That You know, there comes a time when, when even at the risk of bloodshed, now granted, both sides couldn't see how bloody the war would be or how long it would last. But this noxious institution had lasted over 250 years. Uh, Southern, uh, there was also constitutional pressure, anti-libertarian movements by Southern congressmen and senators to limit uh, gag rules, to censor the mails, to ban um, abolitionist speeches, posing a growing threat to American democracy at home and trying to steer um, its foreign policy abroad by acquiring Cuba, Nicaragua, and extending slavery where it either no longer existed or where it had been abolished. So I think you could, I don't see any counterfactual history that could prevent the war at um, in any realistic way. Well, I started out by saying in, in my response to another question, and I, I agree it would be, would have been difficult to avoid the war, mainly because there's nothing to scare people into avoiding it. 
So that's why I, I'm, I hardly say anything about Lincoln in my book. I think if you take Lincoln out, you're just looking at how eagerly everybody volunteered. Uh, and the same thing happened in 1900. Teddy Roosevelt was worst among them. The war was glorious, because now the Civil War horrors were 50 years behind. And Europe was the same way in 1914. They were all eager to volunteer. War was glorious. It was the fulfillment of men and all that stuff. Well, they hadn't seen any massive killing lately. But the situation was different in the, after World War II and the Cold War. And that, so what I'm really asking is, if let's just imagine if we could have avoided the war then what would have been the likely consequences? And I, as the, the, what most of the book is about is, is trying to draw on the experience of other countries in the Western Hemisphere, because they all got rid of slavery in the same short period, and most of them did so with minimum levels of violence. Now, the United States had the largest slave society by far, four million. And uh, you know, applying the insights of Wilberforce and Clarkson, they recognized that the British Caribbean, which was 800,000 slaves in, uh, when they were liberated in the 1830s, that's a much smaller uh, target, four million. And, and the one paradox was it was the only slave society where the, where the numbers were increasing without, without slave imports. So it was a harder, it's not that the methods were the peaceful, persistent methods of agitation and economic pressure and so on were less effective. They're dealing with a much larger uh, not to crack, and that, that would take longer. But we, again, the backlash that I'm referring to is a, has occurred in many other places by people who are trying to get even, and we're seeing that in the Middle East right now, um, among other places. It, it's truly uncontrollable. Yes, sir, back there. Did emancipation, did emancipation with compensation ever get off the ground as a... I'm sorry, did emancipation? Emancipation with compensation, a buyout. Did that ever get off the ground? In the United States? Yeah. No. All. No. Why not? Um, well, I, I don't think they felt... Well, the, the, there are cultural reasons, historical reasons. Uh, the, the Spanish, Spanish and Portuguese America, there was much more manumission. <laughs> And you might say this goes back to maybe a Roman times. There was much more manumission. Uh, the, the, the Southerners in the United States were very much against manumission. They, they didn't want anybody to buy anybody's freedom. Now, uh, there were, uh, Lincoln, I, I believe, uh, did raise the idea of, of some kind of compensation, but it, it, it never got very far in the United States. In, I'm sorry? Washington, D.C., right, you're right, thank you. Okay. But uh, there, were, it was, there was much more acceptable in, in Latin America. And I think there are a variety of reasons for that, which I probably needn't go into, sociological, uh, that, that the fact that uh, men came to uh, Latin America, and so they often ended up with relationships with, with slaves, and so they are much more tolerant of, uh, of, of uh, Creole children, and so there's much, I mean, it's things like that that is much more acceptable, so it's a, it's a shorter distance to go for, for, for essentially paying them off to go away peacefully, which is what it was. And in the United States, there was very strong opposition to it. But again, you're starting, there, there was opposition to, to, uh, to compensated emancipation everywhere at first. This was true in Brazil, but eventually it became a very important thing. The slaveholders had to be kept under pressure, and eventually they respond to what their options are. And, and the amazing thing about the emancipation story is how long uh, the pressure was maintained and, and how much experience there is with, with uh, nonviolent means of, of getting to a much better place. Yes, ma'am. My understanding is that there certainly were uh, 
racist attitudes, for want of a better word. There, there certainly were continuing cultural views of blacks by whites, but you did not have the terrorism that in, in Jamaica, for example. I mean, you still had uh, you know, elements of a, uh, you know, traditional attitudes, class society, whatever you want to call it, but you did not have the terrorism that, that we saw in the American South after, uh, you know, in, in the reaction to the Civil War, in, in reaction, you know, the, the, the driven by revenge. Uh, same thing in Brazil. But you had much more, you know, much, much more diverse, complicated society, so it was harder for people to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to, to adopt those, those views. Yes, ma'am. Right. I mean, you had all them, all these laws that came out, Jim Crow laws and stuff. Right. All the well, the black co the, the black codes before the Jim Crow laws. Yeah. Well, I mean, whatever. I'm right. sure there's a sequence of quite a bit of things right. that happened. Don't you think that? And then with the governments passing the laws, right. the Segregation. Uh, uh, the government, even uh, with Wilson, uh, taking off the, uh, the, you know, not letting people to be in the government. Right. All these things happen that just kept it a, a, another form of slavery, shy-carping and all these other things that came in and the not being able to vote. and It's the whole litany of things that went down that made it so that, hey, you had to go all the way up to 1964 to get a civil right. Right. The people who were emancipated in 1862. Right. It's, <clears throat> The government has something, pro some problems with it too, like you said. Oh, the, the laws in the, in this country, it went along with it. Right. Sharecropping is a form of slavery. It's the same thing now with the immigration. Substandard wages for people, people working at three dollars and fifty cents in sweatshops. It's the same gambit all the way. Well, it's it's a lot different than being in chains and oh, being oh, whipped definitely. and being owned. So we're. Uh, oh, definitely. Uh, in, in, in reaction to, to your thought about the, the aftermath of the Civil War, I, I, I might say that one of the most bizarre things to me is when you, you say, you, you think, well, the, the North was on our side in favor of emancipation. And uh, I mean, you know, in, in, give, given the sides available, that was comparatively good guys. But after the Civil War, we had the beginning of Memorial Day celebrations. And in the Memorial Day celebrations, in the name of reuniting brother with brother, you had uh, Southern uh, Confederate veterans and Union veterans getting together. And for decades, this began to, this went on and on. And, and the way they, they, they avoided anything controversial or upsetting in, in their celebrations, they were mourning the dead. But the only thing they couldn't talk about was slavery and emancipation. And so, you got to 1913, the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, a president whom many people admire, both Democrats and Republicans, Woodrow Wilson, the 50th anniversary of, of, uh, of Gettysburg, gave a speech in which he described the Civil War as a quarrel forgotten. The North is supposed to be on your side, and yet the only thing you can't talk about is slavery and emancipation and any other related issues. That, so how much confidence do you have in being able to solve, to, to achieve a social, a major social reform by getting involved in a, in a war? You need to change people's hearts and minds and get a buy-in so you can turn your back and not having somebody coming at you with a, with a lynch mob. And, and when you compound racism with revenge, that is taking a step backward. It's a much more difficult, complicated thing to deal with and the ways that some of these other people I've talked about in, in Spanish, Portuguese America, uh, in the Caribbean and so on, they were moving much more in a straight line. Sometimes they were taking half steps and have what might be considered moral compromises, but they were, they were at least moving toward the target instead of making these terrible steps backward. Yes, sir? Let's, let's take one last question and then we'll go up for informal questions. What I wanted to say, I, I may not need that. No, for the, we'd like to have it on tape. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm a Civil War reenactor, and I represent the African American's perspective during the Civil War. And I do presentations all over the country. And as late as 
2005, I spoke at a place called the Coastal Heritage Society in Savannah, Georgia. And one of the things the organizer said to me, he said, please do not mention William Tecumseh Sherman. (laughs) (laughs) But what I really wanted to say is that one of the things that the South thought about the North was that they were, there was no difference between the people because all of the colonies were slaveholders. Because of the climate of the North, it changed the economy. You see slavery being abandoned by Northern states simply because of the economy and the free labor system was, was born out of economic, just plain economics. Now, the gentleman who said that maybe the Civil War uh, could have ended any other way uh, other than the Civil War, I mean, slavery ending any other way, you see a lot of things that occurred by the government or by the politicians of the day to kind of end slavery. You see it in the Ordinance of 1787. You see it in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which gave a a, a demarcation, line of demarcation. They had a typography problem in the territories. What would they have grown? You had Southerners who did not do the things that was necessary to replenish the soil. Cotton and tobacco were harsh crops. They could not continue to grow them. That was the reason for the expansion, but they knew that they couldn't expand it into Texas. They knew they couldn't expand it into the Oklahoma Territory. So slavery, even though it may have taken another century, it may have ended as it did in the North without violence. It did not, slavery throughout the original colonies, there was no violence in the ending of slavery in the Northern states. And people forget that, none whatsoever, just as you had mentioned with other places around the world. But the whole issue behind the the Civil War and and the abandonment, this lady and I were talking about the abandonment of the Republican Party. You see a lot of changes. Frederick Douglass stopped printing the North Star because he thought that it was the time of deliverance. And it wasn't. We talk about civil rights. It hasn't occurred yet, to be honest with you. You see all types of forms of slavery coming about in the southern states or replacement of the southern uh, institution of slavery, such as the penal institutions. We still have one major prison in Louisiana, Angola, that was a cotton plantation during the Civil War. Those are for those criminals that get the sentences of two to 300 years. They never, they, they all die in that prison. But you see a lot of things such as the pig laws that was put on the books in the southern states. We, we, we need to. Oh, I'm sorry. Question. Okay. Well, m- my question was, you know, <laughs> it was really a statement and a thank you for coming out. A thank you for your effort to put this into print I appreciate and it. to thank bringing you. about the, um, the comparison between the abolition of slavery and Great Britain. The the case I think that you referred to uh, was the Somerset case. Right. The Somerset case really set the precedent for Roger Taney's decision in uh, in 1857. When when they when you look at it, it's the same principles. The Somerset case was a slave who was taken to England who jumped ship, a trial was held, and he was determined to be free. That case set the precedent for what Tawney did in 1857. He took it the opposite way, that any slave moving to a free territory was not free. But I just wanted to thank you, actually, for doing that, and just to mouth off about a few things.